Peace be yours in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our text this morning is Luke chapter 15, a parable that Jesus told. It's one of three parables that he tells in this chapter. I don't know if you noticed in the bulletin, it said that we read verses 1 to 3 and then verses 11 and following. Why the skipping around? Uh, The skipping around was that Jesus was hanging around with sinners, as he often did. And Jesus, at the same time, was being criticized by the Pharisees and tax collectors, or the the Pharisees and teachers of the law, as they often did. And so you get this section that says, and he told them this parable. But he tells them three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the parable that we're going to talk about this morning. So it wants us to introduce that subject of parables that Jesus is going to speak. But I want to say something this morning. I have to be totally clear about this. In my Bible, the Bible is the Word of God. But in that, there's the section headings. Are you ready for something you need to know? The section headings are not part of the Bible. Does everybody know that? Right? They're there to help you. Sometimes you're looking for a text thinking, where was that passage on the, you know, the thief on the cross? And you thumb through and you find it. That's, the section headings are wonderfully helpful. Are the section headings inspired by God? No, they're not. This is not a study Bible, but many of you have study Bibles. I do too. And at the bottom of the page, there's commentary about the Bible. I want us to know this. Everything above the line is the Bible. Everything below the line, not Bible. Right? Are we clear on that? Very good. We have to always distinguish. We take a high view of Scripture. I'm going to say a couple things about uh, why do we take a high view of Scripture. Here's a couple passages in the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is God-breathed, right? All scripture is God-breathed. 2 Peter 1.21, prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So where did we get this? God, the Holy Spirit, breathed the word of God into his prophets and his apostles, and we want to handle it as such. The word of God, bearing in mind the section headings are not Bible. The commentary at the bottom of the page, not Bible. Are you ready for something really crazy? This sermon is not the Bible, right? Everybody needs to know that when your pastor speaks. Hopefully the pastor is preaching about the Bible, right? But it's not the Word of God. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that, the reason maybe you think I'm belaboring that point, is that my Bible, with these three, cha- uh, three parables, refers to the first one as the parable of the lost sheep. Man has 100 sheep, one gets lost, he leaves the 99, he goes and looks for that one, right? You know that parable. The second one is the parable of the lost coin. A woman has 10 coins, she loses one, she sweeps the entire house until she finds it. And then she rejoices and with her neighbors. So we would say the parable of the lost sheep, I get it, the parable of the lost coin. You know what they do with our parable today? They call it the parable of the lost son. And I personally went to quibble with that I get it, the parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin, parable of the lost son, I want to change it. I want to call it the parable of the lost sons. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you have seen this parable before. The parable of the lost sons. These are the first words of Jesus. There was a man who had two sons. It doesn't say one was lost and one was saved, does it? There was a man who had two sons. They're both lost, but in a different way. I want us to be very clear about that today. I want us to be clear about something that we do. I hope I'm not just rebuking, I think I do it too. Very often when parents have two kids, and sometimes we have more than that, there's nothing wrong with writing as many as you like, but two kids, We often refer to one of them as the good kid. They know where I'm headed. And we refer to the other one as, well, we know what we don't want to say, so we say our difficult kid, our challenging kid. We won't 
say what we're thinking. We're thinking, I have a good kid and I have a what? A bad kid. That's in our mind. I have a good kid and I have a bad kid. I want us to look at this parable and see what Jesus says about this, the way we divide people into these camps. A man owns an estate. A man owns a vineyard. A man owns a field. You see that imagery in the parables all the time. The man is everywhere and always God, right? Every time you see a parable, a man owns God. God and two kids. That's us. Now, I want us to look at the younger son. I want to focus on him for a few moments. He speaks. Dad, give me my share of the estate. What do you think about that? He's entitled, right? That's what he feels. He's entitled. Dad, give me what's mine. In fact, what he's saying is, Dad, I don't feel like waiting around for you to die. Give me what's mine right now. Now, let me ask this. Who owns the estate? The dad. Who works the estate? The dad does. And who built it up to what it is? Dad. And the son says, I want what's mine. And shockingly, the father gives it to him. No. Young man, lots of money. How's that going to go? He wanders off to a distant country. The Bible says he squandered it in wild living. I love the fact that Jesus uses the decorum here, right? What kind of things did he do? Doesn't say, but you can probably figure it out. Life is full of temptations. Of which did he partake? Probably all of them. Aren't you popular when you say the next round is on me? You got lots of friends, right? Hey guys, I got the tab. Lots of friends. But I want us to catch this. Is it not the case that when people dive into all the things that the world offers, he is thinking he's, the, he's worldly wise, right? He's done everything. He's seen everything. He knows all about it. Right? Is he right? He's not. Everybody loves him as fine as, as long as the money is there. What happens to the money? It spends it out. It's gone. There's a famine. He hires himself to, to work for another guy. He could have been working for dad. Now he's working for another guy. And that guy says, go work in the field with the pigs. You probably know, but we should be explicit. That's considered filthy work to Israel. Unclean work. To work with the pigs. He's entitled. He's inexperienced, but think he's wise. The key verse is verse 17. In the modern translation, it says, when he came to his senses. I love it in the Greek. It actually says, when he came to himself. What do we call that? When he hit bottom. When he hit bottom, he came to himself. I love the phrase, he came to himself. Because when we sin, against whom do we sin? We, we offend God, of course. We often sin against our spouse. We sin against our kids, our neighbors, our colleagues. But this is the thing. When we sin, who do we hurt the most? Ourself, right? It says he came to himself and he looks at it and says, what have I done? And I love that he prepares a speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's prepared a speech. He's milled it over in his head. He's sitting in the, the slop with the pigs. He's had time to think about it. And he says, I'm going to go back to dad, and I'm going to say this to him. And while he's in that mood, he's repentant, right? What's the hard part? When he says, he got up and went to his father. That's the hard part. Now... You heard the parable read. You've heard it before, probably. Will his father receive him? Yes. That's what he's worried about, right? He's thinking, 
all the things I've done. He's milling it over in his mind. He's figuring out the stuff he's done. He's thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm not even worthy to be your son, Dad. Just hire me. Just hire me, that's all. And he's thinking, I wonder if Dad's going to receive me. I do know this. If I was the dad, I would have a little speech myself, right? But Dad receives him. Not as a servant, but as a son. And a robe, and a ring, and a sandal, and a feast. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about the lavish grace of our God. And so some of us will think, well, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. Don't need to either. God does, and he waits, right? The son returns. The grace is lavish. Who's telling this parable? Jesus is. So Jesus is the one who is illustrating in Christ the grace and mercy of God are lavish and rich. More than we expect. More than we deserve, of course, but more than we imagine. That's a wonderful parable. It would be great if the parable ended right there, right? It would say, wow, if we would come to God, he would forgive everything. Does it end there? Nope. Because Jesus says the bad kid, he's received by the father. But there is the good kid. Let's talk about him. The older son is faithful. He's loyal. He's hardworking. He gets good grades in school. The bad kid was sent to the principal's office, right? The bad kid calls dad from the police department. The good kid does his work. The neighbors look at the good kid and they shake their head and say, it's, oh, it's so bad what the young kid did, but this guy, he's a good guy. Is he? Is he? I want to get this. There is such a thing as external righteousness. <laughs> There's the stuff that we can see outside. When somebody gets drunk and they fall down in the street, we can see that and say, oh, look at that. Is that all that God sees? God sees the heart. And the good kid, for all of his hard work, as high as his GPA might have been, in his heart, there's a quiet resentment, right? There's a quiet resentment. How did he get to that place? I want us to know, no one is sinless, we know that, we say it. But somehow in our mind, we think, yeah, but some of us are a little better, right? We think that. And he's thinking to himself, I generally do what I'm supposed to do. God, uh, God I say, well, dad says, go do this, I go do it. Dad expects this of me, I meet the expectations. And he does it, but he's churning it around in his heart. I'm getting tired of always doing the good thing. I'm getting tired of being unappreciated. That's what he's thinking. I never forget this. Um, I went to a large uh, public high school. There were 770 kids in my graduating class, 770. Such a big place, there's only two kinds of kids that get attention. The misbehaved kid, they get lots of attention and effort, and the geniuses, they get lots of counseling and extra treatment. I was neither one of those. I don't think my guidance counselor knew my name, right? And so he's churning on this. And when the son, other son comes back, it boils over. It boils over in resentment against his dad and anger at his brother. And I want us to get this refusal to forgive his brother. He's thinking, all the things that I've done, and I want to get this. He's so resentful that what he says cannot possibly be true. Did you hear what he said? He said, Dad, all the years I've served you, I've never disobeyed you. Really? Really? And also this, you never held a feast for me. Never, Dad. You never did a thing for me. Is that possibly true? It's not even remotely possibly true. By the way, it's a big estate. It's an estate. It's got fields. It's got servants, plural. 
He's living on the estate of a wealthy man. What kind of life is he even living? Nobody does nothing for me. Really? It's the parable of two lost sons. Very different ways, but two lost sons. I want us to catch this phrase. The father went out and pleaded with him. The son was in the distant country. He came back and the dad saw him. That's much more passive than this sentence. The father went out and pleaded for him. The father looked for this young man. And the young man waves his finger in dad's face. Can you imagine? Come in. Salvation is to be in. We've talked about that. The invitation is to be in the kingdom. The invitation is to be in the party. The invitation is to be in the wedding feast. In is salvation. Outside is lostness. So here's the big question. Does the older son go in? What's it say in the Bible? It doesn't. Isn't that a little scary? It doesn't say. It does not say, does he go in? He leaves us hanging. I'll never forget this. At my church in Connecticut, I was teaching this parable on a Wednesday Bible class. I don't usually mention people's names, but one of the godly saints there, she's with the Lord now, so I think I can say a woman named Nancy Lutz, you don't know her, but she was a longtime Lutheran school teacher, lifelong Lutheran, a member of our church, a total sweetheart. And I said, did the older son go in? And Nancy raised her hand, and I said, yes, Nancy. And she said, I'll never forget it, he pouted, and then he went in. I, lo- I love that answer. I think that's exactly how we are. He pouted, and then he went in. Take a quick peek at the epistle lesson. I don't have a second sermon on it. You'll be happy to know, but I just want to point out the first verse. This is, that's the message, right? I just want to kind of close with this thought. First verse of the epistle lesson. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Isn't that a wonderful verse? So from now on, he's talking about knowing Christ, knowing grace, having been forgiven myself. I'm the good kid or the bad kid, whichever one I was. Having been forgiven myself, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. You know what he's saying? It's time to stop the good kid, bad kid dichotomy. This church has good kids and bad kids are where we were, right? What we really have is the redeemed. To drop the good kid, bad kid, let's just say this. There are a bunch of kids in this place, all in different ways, but still in the need of grace. Is that right? A bunch of kids in need of grace and richly received by their heavenly father. Amen. We stand together. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.